All right, let's talk about quinones. The first thing you need to know about quinones is recognizing how to make one and what a quinone is in the first place. So for your purposes, the only time you're going to be making a quinone in this course is if you see a benzene ring that has two OHs on it. And what it will result in is a six-membered ring with two carbonyls where those OHs formerly were, and then two carbon-carbon double bonds in the ring such that everything is in resonance. Okay. Now, there's a really, really important rule you have to remember for your quinone forming, your forming reaction. Um, and that is the OHs must be ortho or para to each other. If you have meta OHs, the reaction will not occur and you will not form a quinone. All right, now what is the reaction? What do you expect to see over the arrow? So I've written oxidizer and base because that's the simplest way to explain it. You need an oxidizing agent and then you need some base to pull off a proton. But what you'll most likely see is something involving chromium as your oxidizer. So in Orgo 1 we learned about Jones reagent, H2CrO4. And that's going to be the most common oxidizing agent reagent you use at any point in this course. But another way you can see this is NaCr. O7, CR2O7. Okay? And I notice something. Again, you see chromium. The second you see CR, think oxidizing agent, because that's the only time we use it in this course as an oxidizing agent. Okay? And then it was coupled with H2O and H2SO4. And fun fact, all this stuff does is make Jones reagent. It makes H2CRO4. So ultimately it's the same thing. Now, as far as the mechanism is concerned, I don't really know if you need to know it, because it involves radicals, and usually in Orgo 2 we avoid mechanism questions about radical movement. So I will save that mechanism till the end of the video and focus on the really important bits for now, and then if you're interested in the mechanism, you can follow up at the end of the video and get your fix. All right, so what do you need to know about quinones aside from this rule? Well. Let's talk about two different kinds of quinones you can make, because I focused on the para structure here, but there's another structure you can make, the orthoquinone. And the orthoquinone, now as its name implies, results from a, ben a, a benzene ring with two OHs that were ortho to each other, like that. And what that quinone will look like after it undergoes this reaction arrow is these OHs are now going to be carbonyls double bondos. And where will the double bonds in the benzene ring be? Well, we said that they need to be, there needs to be two of them and they need to be conjugated. So they'll go here and here. And there's your orthoquinone. Okay? So these are the two possible quinones you can make. But now, which one's preferred? Is there a one that's better? The ortho situation versus the para situation? And let's address that by slightly modifying this question. Let's put a third OH on this molecule right here in the ortho position to this OH, okay? So we have, if we're looking at this OH, it has an OH ortho and para to it. Now, when you form a quinone, you're only reacting with two of those OHs, so who's gonna win? Which one's the better OH to use? Well, it turns out the rule is para always wins. And why is that? Let's look at these two structures here for a second. And we have to apply a concept about dipoles. What a dipole is is simply you have two atoms where one is more electronegative than the other, and that more electronegative atom sucks electrons towards itself, creating a partial negative on one end and a partial positive on the other. Well, if we look at carbonyls, we know that they resonate up. They have that very clear dipole, and what that gives you is a single bond O minus carbon positive. Same thing with the one down here, carbon positive O minus. Let's compare that from the ortho. Now, this is the power position. Let's look at the ortho situation. These two, these two oxygens resonate up, you get O minus, O minus, carbon positive. Now notice something that the ortho position has that the para doesn't. It has two light charges right next to each other, and we know that's always bad. We hate having light charges. They repel, and it's not the greatest situation to have. So ultimately what that means for you is, if you have the option of making an, a paraquinone or an orthoquinone, the paraquinone is always more favored and faster to form. Meaning, if, you want, if you're looking for the answer to this question, what is going to be your final product? It's going to be the one where your quinone forms in the para positions like that. 
And then this OH remains exactly the same. It had no involvement in the reaction whatsoever. Okay? Now let's apply one other thought. Or actually, honestly, that's really all you need to know for quinones. Remember that it can only form in the para-ortho position, so the meta, if you ever see two meta-OHs with this reaction, the reactant will be the same as the product. No reaction will occur. And then, if you have the option of choosing two, uh, two possibilities, either ortho or para, para always wins. Okay? And with that, let's just talk about the mechanism real quick. If you don't care about that, you can end the video now and move on to a different one or study something else. But for those who are orgo junkies and want a mechanism, let's draw it out. Let's just stick with the para uh, OHs and see the mechanism. Okay, so the first step is I should draw out my, okay, I should draw out my lone pairs. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So the first step is your oxidizing agent is going to rip off a proton from one of your OHs. So let's say it's the top one. Now, notice what I'm doing here. I am drawing a fish hook arrow, not the usual double-headed arrow that we see for most of our mechanisms. Like I said before, this reaction involves radicals. And so it's not two electrons being pulled off, it's a single electron that's getting pulled off by this oxidizing agent, by the chromium. And what you'll end up getting now is an oxygen with one unpaired electron, one lone pair, and then the rest of the molecule is unchanged. What that does for that oxygen is it makes it positively charged. If you count your formal charges and everything, you'll find that it's positive. And this is why we need a base, because now the base will come in, let's say it was the H2O, and that H2O will grab the proton, neutralizing the oxygen. And notice I'm using red for radical movement and blue for the standard double-headed arrows that we use most everywhere else. So you can kind of see the distinction, because this, this acid-base reaction is no different from any other acid-base reaction we've done before. There's no unpaired electrons involved with these arrows. And so what you're left with now is a neutrally charged oxygen with a single radical and two lone pairs. The other OH is untouched. Now, let's, this mechanism now will show us why the ortho and para positions are always going to be the ones that form, are formed. We've seen that if this was an oxygen with, let's say, a negative charge, that negative charge can resonate down and put electrons into the ortho position through resonance, or resonate a bit further down and push those electrons onto the para position. Well, the same is true for a radical. The radical resonates in the exact same manner. Meaning, if we have this unpaired electron here, it's going to resonate down like so. Now, when we show a double bond forming, we have, or when we show a bond forming with radicals, we have two arrows converging at each other. Because remember, radicals are the movement of single electrons. We have one electron here and two electrons from the double bond. One of those electrons from the double bond goes up to meet the radical of the oxygen to form our new carbon-oxygen double bond. The other electron of the double bond will be moved to either the, or, let's say, to the ortho position. Okay? And so that gives us a resonance structure such that it looks like this. Oxygen double bond, our ring, a radical in the ortho position, and the two other double bonds are untouched. And now this oxygen is neutral, no radicals involved. That radical can resonate one more time down into the para position. So two converging, uh, two converging fish hooks to show what double bonds forming there, and the last fish hook going to the para position to show where the radical will end up at the end. And that gives us the radical now in the para position where we want it. But what you see is the reason why the quinones can only form in the ortho and para positions is because the radical is only able to resonate to those ortho and para positions. But now we have that radical in the position we care about, the position adjacent to the other OH. So this double bond was untouched. This is our new double bond, our radicals in the para position, and we have our OH. What happens next is basically a repeat of the first two steps. That oxidizing agent is going to come in one more time. And I'm just going to write bracket O for a shorthand of oxidizer. That thing, that chromium or whatever oxidizing agent we're using is going to come in and rip off another pro, uh, electron. And yeah, okay. And so now, once again, we'll be left with a oxygen positive with a single unpaired radical electron. Not counting the radical that's already in the para position. Now we have two radicals. 
vertical counting that radical. We have two radicals now. Now what's going to happen is one more time, your, your base will come in, pull off that proton, neutralize the oxygen whose charge I forgot to drop. This oxygen was positive. And now we're going to have two radicals right next to each other such that it looks like radical in the power position, radical on the oxygen with its two lone pairs. And finally what's going to happen is those two radicals will converge at the bond between the carbon and the oxygen, forming your double bond and giving you the paraquinone that you expect. And that's the mechanism. Do you need to know it? I really don't know. Most likely not. And with that, that's all you really need to know about quinones as far as I know.